Say what? You move really fast. You're listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriting. My name is Mark Linsenmeyer. For more information about this podcast, please check out nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. My guest today for episode 15 was Craig Wedrin. During the 90s, he was the lead singer of Shudder to Think. He's gone on to do a lot of soundtrack work for TV and movies, in addition to his solo career. This thing you are listening to right now is part of ex-French T-shirt from Shudder to Think's Pony Express record from 1994, their first major label release. We will be discussing the song Pebbles from the previous record Get Your Goat from 1992, and jumping forward to 2004 to Slow Down by his short-lived band Baby, which has since been released as Craig Wedren and Baby. And we're going to move to a very recent soundtrack song that is I Am A Wolf, You're The Moon from the Wet Hot American Summer First Day of Camp soundtrack. And we're going to wrap up by listening to his song Heaven Sent from his solo album Juan, which came out in 2011. Craig is a tremendously creative, really interesting composer. To learn more about his work, go check out craigwedrin.com. Hello, Craig. How you doing? During my little introduction, I'll play some of X French T-shirt. Oh, yay. Great. Like, that's supposedly your most popular song, <laughs> according to Spotify. It's a massive hit. It's unavoidable in the malls and uh, <laughs> grocery stores of America. And I guess like many of the Shudder to Think songs, the structure is a little strange. The structure is a little hard to follow. Mm-hmm. I mean, that song, you've got a quite a long buildup and then it repeats this refrain that it finally gets to over and over and over again and sort of crescendos throughout the song. And we're going to hear on Pebbles here on the first song a different approach to structure than on your more traditional stuff, on the other two songs we're going to discuss. Yeah, I was bound and determined at that point in my songwriting to only be making what I felt was truly new music. I had a, I mean, I guess I still do, but certainly then in my teens and 20s had very lofty, cocksure ideas about what was worthy in all caps. And I did not want to, and still don't, intend to throw more of the same onto the ever-expanding snow pile of music, and particularly pop music. Um, and I use pop in the loosest sense of the word. But at the time, I am shudder to think we were very puritanical, and we wanted to uh, do things that hadn't been done before. And so the traditional structures went out the window, traditional chord progressions went out the window, traditional lyrics, melodies, styles of singing, you know, and even guitar tone in some cases to a certain extent kind of went out the window. But it was still, with Shutter to Things music, and, and in Pebbles even, there's still a sort of classicism. And I'm sure we were accused at times of having kind of prog tendencies, but, you know, nor did we sound like Rush. So we were just kind of our own beast. And I think that X-French T-shirt and Pebbles are both actually pretty good examples, although Pebbles goes all over chord-wise, whereas X-French is basically two chords or three chords. Those are, they're two very good examples of like Shudder to Think, just trying to be Shudder to Think. Well, I guess what I get out of hardcore as opposed to metal, I mean, hardcore is basically metal guitar sounds, but that it's a more riff-oriented approach to songwriting, that instead of playing, you know, nice A, nice D, nice E, we're doing one in five only, no third, so it's not minor nor major, and then we're moving up a half step and we're jig, 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 jig there, and then we're going back to, like, that's the basic approach to songwriting for hardcore. Or or am I misunderstanding? What is is hardcore, actually? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Does it matter? I, I, never, I never got like hard. I never really understood hardcore as a um, genre because for me, there are all these bands that were lumped in with hardcore, which I still think are some of the greatest bands of all time. Like on the one side, you had Bad Brains, who were certainly one of the most technically proficient hard rock bands, I think, of all time and innovative and humbling. And then you had bands like X, who were very traditional in certain ways and, you know, with a lot of country and, and roots and, and rockabilly influences, but were somehow also still considered hardcore. So I think hardcore and punk and pretty much any other label you can come up with is just something that gets made up 
maybe by media, maybe by kids, to help young people feel like they belong to something or to make it easy to sell mag. On the one hand, like on a personal level, I think um, labels like hardcore or polka, for that matter, help people with uh, identify with one another and identify themselves and identify with others. Mm -hmm. Certainly as a teenager growing up in the 80s, I grew up in Cleveland before I moved to D.C. and there were very, very few freaks at the time. I think there were a lot of freaks in Cleveland in the 70s and I think they kind of went the way of the dodo by the 80s. And so, you know, you could recognize your own people in a very kind of John Hughes (laughs) film-like sort of a way by who had the most rat tails and the Depeche Mode pin on their, you know, trench coat. And so you would gravitate toward those people. Hey, man, are you into hardcore? Or like, hey, man, are you into new wave? And it would just sort of help with this kind of, uh, you know, the the tribalism that I think teenagers in particular need. And in particular back then, I think in the 21st century, there are so few boundaries and so much access that the signifiers don't work anymore. Um, But at the time, it was actually really important. So hardcore, going back to your question, taking the very long, (laughs) because... And maybe part of it was growing up in Cleveland where weirdos took whatever they could get. It didn't matter if it was um, Perubu, Stravinsky, or the Bee Gees. There wasn't as much distinction between this style and that genre. It was all manna. In D.C. and in New York and in Los Angeles, which were more allegedly sophisticated metropoli, I think the distinctions were kind of more conservative and rigorous and boundaried. And so in D.C. in particular, the term hardcore, I don't blame Ian MacKay or Minor Threat or Discord because I know that those guys are artists and idealists. But as so often happens, whether it's the Beatles or... Fugazi, the masses, the boys of America at the time, sort of took the mantle and turned it into a code of repetition. And that's when hardcore became like what you were saying, whatever it is, three chords in the truth. But it never made a whole lot of sense. And it certainly lacked sexiness or, you know, any kind of psychedelic consciousness, which was something that was always a lure for me. All right, so on this song, Pebbles, we don't hear a lot of the hardcore cliches other than somewhere in the middle, there's a that rears its head. I discovered Shudder to Think only, I was not aware of it when you were actually active in the 90s. I don't know what I was <laughs> what I was doing at the time, but it did not reach me in Ann Arbor and then Austin. But this time I discovered you guys, I don't know, four years ago or something. I think it was when reruns of The State went on the air. And the, the theme to that was so distinctive and strange that I had to look up, oh, who did that? Oh, okay, I've heard of Shudder to Think. And I went through your albums. However, I had not discovered the, the first album, the Curses, Spells, Voodoo, uh, Mooses album until just this last week prepping and going back. And I always like to hear the first album, especially if it's not a fully developed thing, if it's not on a major label or something, because you can kind of hear this is how the songwriting, whether how it started or what the fundamental approach is. Like I actually understood the songwriting on that, (laughs) that it sounded (laughs) like I'm coming up with some chords and I'm singing over them and like, okay, that's the way I generally write. By the time you get to get your goat and, and albums like that, we've advanced to somewhere a little harder to get a hold of. Right. Well, with Curses, well, uh, looping back to the state theme and bringing it back to DC Hardcore, I sampled the band Nation of Ulysses, who were a wonderful, um, weird, I guess, sort of the same era as Shudder to Think. There was this thing that happened in DC after the initial wave or two of punk rock. And that was that people really started to individualize. And Nation of Ulysses was this kind of, I don't know, futurist noise machine fronted by Ian Spinonius. And their music was so rousing and such a call to action and so sort of teenaged and 
other in a way. And at the time that the state was happening, those were all my friends from college, they needed a theme song. And I had a brand new Akai mono proto sampler. And so I was just sampling everything. And I sampled Nation of Ulysses and I was playing ukulele into my little realistic Radio Shack microphone. And I think there's a, some 50s drum beat sampled there and God knows what else. And so it's a huge collage. But then jumping back to, or jumping forward, I guess it would be back from the state to uh, Curses, which came out in 89. Sandwich Records, which is the label that put out Shutter to Things first record, was, I guess, an imprint is the word, of Discord Records. So Discord is run by Ian Mackay. Ian's little sister, Amanda, and I went to high school together in at this pretty progressive, very small high school right around DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. And I fell into this band, Shudder to Think. I had moved from Cleveland, gotten kicked out of a few bands for singing the way that I do. And I was in a play with a girl at the school and she said, hey, my boyfriend just lost their singer from his hardcore band and they need a new singer. So she slid me a cassette of this band that was called Stooge, S-T-U-G-E with umlauts over the U. And I listened to it and it was just like, like the three chords hardcore uh-huh. thing. They were good, but it was hardcore. I wasn't ever much of a screamer. I listened to it, but frankly, speaking of teenage identities, you know, my whole sense of self was wrapped up in being a singer in a band, and I really didn't have very many friends yet, and so I was uh, kind of in free fall, and she sort of held out this rope, and I thought, okay. So I listened to a few of these songs, a few of which would wind up on curses, albeit pretty dramatically altered once... I reinterpreted the vocals that Mm -hmm. had originally been, you know, written and sung by the original singer. So I got into the rehearsal space with Shudder to Think, and they didn't like my voice. I didn't like their music. We became a band. And within a year, we sort of discovered that the sort of you put your chocolate in my peanut butter combination was maybe going to be something special. And we all really liked each other. So a lot of the songs that you hear on Curses were songs that were written before I joined the band. And Chris Matthews, who was the guitar player in Shudder to Think for the first six years out of our Mm -hmm. 12-year stint, was A, just a brilliant guitar player and a wonderful human being, still is. But also, I think like the rest of us, he was raised on classic rock. He liked The Who and he liked The Rolling Stones and The Kinks and The Clash and then sort of punk took over... So there was this smush of kind of traditional who like garage pop or mod metal, whatever you want to call it, that then got uh, Shanghai by punk and by DC hardcore. And that's sort of what you hear. So there is a more traditional aspect to it. And I think it actually pretty truthfully reflects all of our undiluted or unevolved isn't quite the word, but before we kind of found our own voice. And so you're right. Those are more traditional chord progressions, more traditional melodies in many respects. And yet you hear these sort of little shards and spikes and hints and leaps of weirdness to come. All right. So jumping forward, Get Your Goat is, I believe, the fourth album, 1992. The song Pebbles is off that. Do you have any, anything to say to introduce the song before we play it? Pebbles was one of the... Get Your Goat was the first record where I started writing a lot of the music, a lot of the music Mm -hmm. myself. There's still a lot of guitar riffs and ideas that Chris Matthews was writing, but I had this surge that was happening then. And I remember the records that were particularly blowing my mind around Get Your Goat, or that inspired a lot of the writing for Get Your Goat. Not that you would hear it or recognize it, because again, we were bound and determined to do our own thing. But... The three records were Ozma by the Melvins, Ride the Lightning by Metallica, and Isn't Anything by My Bloody Valentine. Isn't Anything Changed My Life. I actually think there's a lot of 
isn't anything elements in Pebbles. Although I couldn't tell you exactly what songs or exactly what things. But there's something about the, I want to say, topography of it. It goes so many places. It's got chapters, little mini chapters. And at the time, I couldn't sing and play at the same time. So in Shudder to Think, up until the very end, we would write all of the music before I would start on vocals. So I think that's one of the reasons why you hear very little repetition or why when things repeat, they don't repeat for very long. Because basically I would write or Chris would write or we would repeat as a band whatever riff constituted our A part, you know, let's Mm -hmm. call it both pebbles, as long as it felt not boring. And then the second we were like, let's do something else. We would add another part. And rather than jumping back to the A part, we would just throw in a C part and then maybe a D part. And then maybe we would go back to the B part. So it was really like writing Shutter to Think songs was a puzzle in keeping ourselves, the writers, interested on an instrumental level because there were no vocals. You know, so Pebbles is an interesting song without vocals. But then the vocals, you know, give it narrative and give it melody. And I don't even remember how the vocals came up. I do remember writing the lyrics. But I think those particular influences isn't anything by My Bloody Valentine, A number one, are are kind of the spike juice that we were drinking.
So I saw at least concertists from 1993 or four on YouTube that you're actually playing the little arpeggio part at the beginning. So that's something that you came up with. So you're saying that this is not even an identifiable chord. You're just <laughs> doing things with your fingers and seeing what was cool. Forget Your Goat and Pony Express record, which personally for my own songwriting style, those were the most kind of quote unquote me records. Mm -hmm. I would move my fingers around the fretboard until I heard something that A, I hadn't heard before and that B, made my spine tangle or whatever part of me tingle. And the arpeggiated thing, I still do that particular pebbles pattern. It's got this really interesting snake eating its own tail imperfect figure eight to it. So satisfying to play. It's very meditative for me and keeps my mind and fingers occupied. And I still use that pattern all the time when I'm writing new music and when I'm writing score. It's all over my new record, which I'm just finishing. A few of the key songs from my new record started as pieces of score for Jill Soloway's movie, Afternoon Delight, and Stuart Blumberg's movie, Thanks for Sharing, which were just a few years ago. So I really do notice that whenever I pick up a guitar, there are things, particularly from Get Your Goat, and within Get Your Goat, particularly from Pebbles, which I still use not as items on a menu, not like, oh, I'm going to do like that Pebbles thing. It's just this very natural. I understand that. And, you know, what my own arpeggiation stuff, I just blame it on my lack of technique that I end up doing the same damn thing <laughs> too often. You had mentioned the prog influence that comes on a couple of these records, or at least the comparisons that are made that yeah. yet, no, you know, you're not doing rush, although there's enough. Well, let's put seven measures instead of six. Let's do, you know, chop one beat off. There's enough of those little things. But I do hear that mid 70s King Crimson thing. And of course, Robert Fripp, got so enamored of these arpeggiation things that he basically has done that the rest of his career for every... Absolutely. There's almost something, I want to say, reptilian about it. For me, it calms the reptile brain. It slows things down, or it elongates time in, in a very soothing way that I experience when I meditate, or when I'm out in nature, or making love, or singing with other people. There's something that happens chorally. That is one of the divine things that music does. What you hear at the beginning of Pebbles was a first-time discovery, I think. Yeah, when Fripp got so enamored of the meditative aspects of that, that he created this, this whole uh, League of Crafty Guitarists. Do you know about this? So it's like a, basically a school. I think it was a summer camp kind of thing of yeah. all these guitarists doing these arpeggios in unison and harmonizing each other and the, the sort of meditative power of that I think was the the theme. Completely and, and and it's interesting that you mentioned Fripp because certainly we were familiar with Discipline mm -hmm. by King Crimson and his stuff on Scary Monsters, the Bowie stuff that he did and the King Crimson stuff or at least just Discipline, we all knew. That was like a really big... Discipline was such a big 80s kind of... It had a big influence on like post-punk people. That was definitely seeping in, even if it wasn't conscious. And then, you know, people would ask us things like... And it probably had something to do with Pebbles. Oh, you guys must be really into the band Love. Or you must be really into Captain Beefheart. And we really didn't know who any of those people were at the time. I mean, it just... You had to have had like a really cool older brother... <laughs> At that point, afterward, of course, it made perfect sense. We're like, oh, yeah, I totally understand why people would have thought that we were into love or beef heart. Well, the other key thing here, maybe this is where the My Bloody Valentine here is this crashing wave part, this do 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 which I was trying yeah. to, so what chord is that? Are you just adding a ninth? What? Kind of, is it sure for me to play a guitar? Go um, right away. You talk about lack of technique. I think almost... Any aspect of my so-called style or technique on guitar comes from lack of technique. So it's just probably a mostly open strings, this... <laughs> mostly open strings. It's like... What is it? I'll figure it out. No. I have no idea. Oh, there it is. I have no idea. Awesome. You have to keep that in. It's been a while <laughs> since you've had to play this live. <laughs> There's so much muscle memory. Like, I have to be standing there with a Les Paul in my hand and standing up in order to know how to play that song. But yes, that's all that it is. It's all of the 
different changes that happen in that part are really like one finger, one fret, another finger, another fret, an open string, and then da 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 bam. And it's just playing the, it's just playing all six strings. And I think on that chord, there's only, I only have one finger on a fret sure. on the whole guitar. But it does, it has that dream pop aspect to it, which was always a huge part of my, I just always gravitated toward it. Not the lighter stuff, but the darker, heavier end of it, the 4AD, My Bloody Valentine world. So you were doing the arrangements in a live setting, so that bass line that kind of is the melodic glue at the beginning, at least, that holds it together. Was that just something Stuart came up with, or was that something you're dictating more or less. I don't remember. I don't remember with that line. So it sounds it's kind of Sonic Youth. I mean the whole song. I'm embarrassed and ashamed that I didn't uh, mention Sonic Youth. Certainly <laughs> Evol Sister in particular and then Daydream Nation has so much of that stuff going on yep. in it. We were all heavily in their sway. So the melodic bass stuff, there's a lot of really nice melodic bass stuff on Funeral of Movies and Get Your Goat. Because again, we were very against, or at least I was, I'm sure I must have annoyed the hell out of my bandmates. You know, at least a couple of whom were just like, can we just play a song? Everything had to be these interlocking, intertwining parts. Every instrument and every part had to be able to stand on its own as an interesting piece of music, right? So if you solo Stewart's bass line from Pebbles, it's a really lovely, interesting line unto itself, and you would never in a million years guess what the chords are that wind up around it. I don't remember who made that up, you know, some of those really sweet bass melodies and bass chords. There was definitely a big thing in DC in the mid-80s where a lot of so-called emo bands, but this was the first definition of emo, not kind of what became sure. bands like Rites of Spring. The band Rites of Spring in particular, who I think are one of the best, there was a lot of two and even three string bass melody chord playing. And mm-hmm. so you would get smears of chords between the guitars and and the bass. And so that also had a big influence on us. And, and I'm sure we were incorporating some of that. And then the drum part as well. I mean, Mike Russell's drums seem very distinctive on the early records that maybe it's just, was it a double bass pedal or just that he was, I mean, there's even in this song, dun, 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 ta, ta, like it's a little more kick than you'd normally hear. Yeah, no, that was just his style. Mike had this beautiful, he still does, it has such a beautiful feel. He kind of, what is it? I, I can picture it. Whenever I think of Mike playing drums, I picture this sort of, he's like dusting everything. So, I mean, he does, he has a really great kick foot, but then his ride and his hat hand, so his right hand, except he's lefty, so it would be his left hand. It just gallops and dances. It's not jazz, because he certainly wasn't coming from that, but it was sophisticated. You know what it was like? It was like DJ Bone Break from X. X was our sort of collective favorite band in Shudder to Think. And I don't know that he was consciously having that DJ bone break sophistication. I think he just naturally had it. And he was sort of an engineer, mathematician type and older than the rest of us. So I think he was trying as hard to like bash everything and destroy everything. And he had a little bit of some measure of restraint and sophistication that the rest of us may have lacked, or certainly I did. Well, I hear a lot of definition in the parts, even in here, just getting out of this. Uh, I mean, the intro is a minute long, so you've got your little arpeggio, and then we move into the crashing wave part, and the arpeggio comes back, but with a more aggressive, definite drum part, and the lead guitar chuck, chuck, chucking under that. And the drums in that section, which the second time is the crashing wave toward the end of the intro, it's seven measures long total with some kind of answering calls so you do the crashing wave with da 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 dun, 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 da and it's all very like mapped out by the drums and i could even picture the drummer either writing it or at least paying very close attention it's very hard for me when i work with drummers to dictate that kind of thing it you know it can take freaking forever if you want something precise like that we used to take forever <laughs> Okay, but he was also mathematically minded such that he would come up with things of that. Oh, sort. I mean, relative to how long it might have taken or <laughs> might have taken other bands or could have taken, it happened quickly, but we were very, very meticulous. We wanted to be the best. I can only speak for myself, but I 
think I speak for the rest of the band when I say we did not want to waste our or anybody else's time. If we were going to do this, it needed to be extraordinary and extraordinarily special. So we just were crazy people. And we, we went in there and we really, 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 really got those parts tight so that everybody was satisfied. And then we played the hell out of them until we were good at playing it. We always wrote songs, certainly I did, and I think I still do, that were a little bit beyond our technical ability. And so it would take us a while to learn how to play these songs live, and we would be lousy at them for a little while. Well, and singing while playing in particular, as you said, if you just had a completed instrumental, and then the way this vocal comes in, where the beat sort of, I was trying to think of what that technique is called, you know, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see like if you change where the accent is every single line that you've got poor little girl, it's on poor the first time, it's on little the second. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just in terms of where the where the one is. Although the way you're singing it, since you're doing the topic, like, well, uh-huh. that's where the emphasis is in the singing. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that's where the one of the measure is. Right. Everything's slipping underneath it. And while it's very deliberate, it feels a little bit like the way solid ground goes liquid during an earthquake. And that is a kind of going back to that reptile brain meditative arpeggiation thing. Another category that always appealed to me or another swoon or sensation that always appealed to me is a particularly blissful disorientation that I like from music where I don't feel like I'm being preached at but it gives me space and room to not quite know where I am, but enough melody and fun that, I don't know, it feels like I'm ice skating or something like that. And so that's what that section feels like to me. And you get a great balance in terms of the, uh, my favorite album of the Shudder to Think is actually the last album because I'm a big, big star and Who fan. And so 50,000 BC channels a little more of that. When you're here, the vocal is not acting like a vocal. The vocal is acting like another one of those interlocking instrumental parts. Just the fact that it's repeating itself in a mantra-like way means it's not Mick Jagger jumping up front (laughs) and delivering the rhymes. I think at least some of that comes from Cocteau Twins, again, a little bit of My Bloody Valentine, where the voice while ostensibly, certainly in the case of the Cogger Twins, is very much a lead instrument, it's not treated as a David Lee Roth. It's not mm-hmm. a carnival barker. It's not a... Um, it's another instrument. It's the instrument we all have. And there was so much pressure in the rock era for the front person and the lead singer to really step up and do something and say something and make it happen and sell the works that I think a lot of times the delicacy and more mystical or subtly seductive qualities of the voice got lost, especially in hardcore. Was it hard to mix this when you're live? I mean, I see that you have a very strong, high piercing voice, like a lot of those voices that do work over hardcore bands, but the way that you're singing it with the with the little, you know, spinning up the traffic in it, like, I would think that that would have to be mixed pretty high in comparison to things and would be easily lost in many a venue. It was really hard. I think looking back, it occurred to me a few years ago, thinking back on the frustration that I and we at Shudder to Think felt particularly the first year or two playing around Washington, D.C. to just perplexed faces. And then hearing whatever, bootleg cassettes or seeing video recordings of those shows, I'm like, oh, no, there are no vocals. Nobody could hear what I was doing. So it definitely took us a while and probably wasn't until we started getting a little more popular that we were playing venues that had the kinds of sound systems that could put me over the top of the band. We were a loud band. I mean, we were at least one, often two marshals, a giant SVT bass cab and seriously hard-hitting drummers. We came from punk rock and from hard rock. We played really hard. I sang really hard, but I also sang really soft. I sang really high and I sang big, but I wasn't a shouter. So it was a very strange 
and we were also young, so we just didn't know anything about gear or, you know, compression or how to keep our amps at a reasonable level on stage so that the vocals could be mixed in. So it was, <laughs> it was definitely, a, it was chaos for a little while. Now, do you want to help decode the lyrics a little bit or do we want to leave them as a cipher? You were saying that they add some narrative structure, but until I sat down and looked at them, I didn't get any of that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even know what the bad part of singing the traffic in her hair as traffic is. What the hell word is that? <laughs> any comments about what, what this song means? Again, lyrically, particularly then, but in general, when I'm doing my own stuff, I like what we were just saying about the slippiness of that one part where the vocal's doing one rhythm, which is changing, the drums are doing another rhythm, which is changing, but they're all playing with one another. Lyrically, what satisfies me is images. So I know that I have a keeper of line or of verse when the Polaroid in my mind is crystal clear. I mean, it might be a fuzzy, blurry, psychedelic Polaroid looking. It might be an impressionistic Polaroid, mm -hmm. but I get a visual image when my lyrics hang together the way I like them to. So for me, Pebbles is a, it's a flip book of images that sat right with me. The images aren't literally narrative. They're more dream images. And at the time, again, one of the big things that was influencing and inspiring me was surrealism, impressionism, and Dr. Seuss. So there's a lot of nursery rhymes gone wrong in the lyrics. And I think with Pebble, so what is it? It's poor little girl screaming traffic in her hair. Poor little girl screaming traffic in her hair. Poor little girl screaming, where'd mom go? So I can just tell you the images that I have when I sing those lyrics. They won't give away any story because how those images connect is really up to the listener and that's the way I like it. So I just pictured, we've all been lost when we're five or eight or 10. I remember being lost at the air show in Columbus and it's a terrible feeling. It's a terrifying feeling. And I remember the sounds of the Blue Angels or whoever it was, those, air, those fighter jets that do their formations, kind of screaming past and trying to stave off panic. So I don't know that I've ever quite made that connection between that lyric and that feeling or experience before, but it might explain part of why the image connected to me is I picture a little girl on a median on a busy boulevard with hilariously crazy, tangly hair who's lost. But it's funnier than that, and it's more Pee Wee Herman or Tim Burton-esque than that. Mm, I don't... <laughs> humor is not one of the things... I hear dream in the song. Humor is uh, in, in the deep background, if that's where... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, but I guess what I mean by humor, it's, there's something cartoonish about mm -hmm. it. It might be, let's call it Adult Swim, not Saturday morning cartoons. That explains the vocal tick in the delivery of the line. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> I've never really thought about this quite like this. Well, there's only two other lines of lyrics. Let's connect those. So it's candles swim low in the basement of one man home. Yeah. Cameras tape you as you approach the door. You can't find your comb. I love that line. I'm having like a sense memory of writing that line. I wrote the lyrics to Pebbles in San Francisco. It was an era where I was definitely interested and into psychedelic experimentation, as a lot of college kids in their early 20s and the early 90s were. And I was with my then girlfriend visiting my friends Rick and Valerie. And I had all of these rehearsal tapes for Get Your Goat. And I would just listen to cassettes while I was going to sleep over and over and over and literally keep a notebook next to my bed with a pen or a pencil and kind of be writing as I was dozing. And after a particularly, let's call it amplified weekend away, we'd gotten back to my friend's house and I was sort of in that half stupor state of being exhausted, but not quite being able to fall asleep listening. My girlfriend was next to me sleeping like a baby. So I couldn't make any noise. And I was listening to a cassette of pebbles over and over and just writing. Oh, just the instrumental part. You're saying this is how you were. Yep. 
Exactly. Well, by that point, actually, so the way it would go is we would just do the music, then we would play the music over and over, and I would just start mumbling and humming. Then would come the vocal melody with some key, you know, vowel or consonants, sure. and then I would write the lyrics around that. So the candles swim low in the basement of one man's one man home. I have a very specific image of my friend Rick and Valerie's. I don't know if we were sleeping in their basement or their living room or what, but to me that evokes the image of where we were sleeping when I wrote those lyrics. Cameras tape you approaching the door. You can't find you. So for me, it's like a paranoia. It is the end of like a long chemically intense weekend. But then there's a little Martino cherry of humor at the end. You can't find your comb. Like, you want to look good for the security cameras of the creepy, freaky people who are, you know, living inside of this basement. And is the title Pebbles just about that these are little, you were saying snapshots, that these are little apparently disconnected, but somehow, why call it Pebbles? Well, yes and no. Now that you say that, I'm remembering thinking that at the time in passing. So I don't think that's even something I've thought of probably since, you know, for 25 years. But also the arpeggiated stuff at the beginning are like pebbles on. Oh, sure. Not so much like pebbles on water. It's more like, you know, a light rain. Raindrops. Yeah, exactly. If you're throwing many pebbles very rapidly (laughs) onto water. No, I got it. And the ripples that go out, the interlocking ripples from, yeah. And for, and for me, the, the song as a whole feels like that. It's, you know, it's like a starts as a little storm and then it becomes a big, crazy gale force thing. And then it, I don't know, how does it end? Um, ba, 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 da, da, da. So this is a good time to transition to the second song, Slow Down, where you likewise have some of the same, I see the same geometric approach to songwriting in terms of taking these, you know, in, the, in terms of slow down, it's the this chunky guitar riff yeah. that comes and just the, the bass thing in the first place. So is this a drum machine with then real drums put over top of it? Is that, is that exactly. Okay. So by the time Slow Down was written, which I probably wrote it around 2002 or so, Shutter Think had been broken up for a few years. And I, in general, in my life, while I certainly wasn't putting the shudder to think style of writing that was sort of very intrinsic and natural aside, because I like to write music that way, I wasn't recording or performing anything like that. And I really just kind of as a reaction to 12 years of shudder to think was interested in sort of doing the opposite, really going deeply into some of the more traditional or forbidden bubblegum, brill building, song craft, you name it, things that we just kind of hurtled past in Shudder to Think without ever touching on, with the exception of curses, kind of like you were saying with curses, there's some traditional chord structure, and with 50,000 BC. 50,000 BC was this transitional record, which I'm still so curious what we would have done after that. But the two things I did in the early 2000s were this band Baby, which was a kind of bubble, glam, roller, metal, dance, electronic rock. Thing. And it was actually called Baby, not Craig Redren and Baby. That's just the retrospective. Yeah, exactly. It was called Baby. Which was you and I saw there's a, like a picture of six people. Uh, you know, yeah. So this was supposed to be an actual full band. This is you and your people you hooked up with in New York. Is there any, there's no members in common, right? You didn't keep a drummer or anything between Sutter to Think? Oh, well, Chuck Scott played drums in Baby and he played keyboard on one of the Shutter to Think okay. tours. He played keyboard with us live sometimes. Other than that, it was all new people, but people who I knew. Mm-hmm. But Baby was very much a studio project for me. Like all, okay. of, all of those songs, with the exception of Soft Feminine Boys, which was an Amy Miles song that I then produced in the style of Baby, and the song Call Wait, which Alex Edenborough, the other female singer in the band, and I co-wrote. They were, for the most part, songs that I would just sit there all day, every day with nothing to do in my Lower East Side apartment. In a time where I was just starting to get my film scoring career off the ground, but otherwise just couldn't get arrested. I mean, I had nothing going on. I would have maybe one movie a year or maybe two movies a year. And other than that, I would just sit there and get out my frustration and slash learn Pro Tools slash 
delve through the entire history of my love for pop music and apply them and sort of like squeeze it through my aesthetic filter, as in the case of Slow Down, which has elements of funk and elements of industrial and elements of like Def Leppard or something in there. I always think of like Photograph when we get to the chorus. Sure, sure. And that guitar part, which is kind of very Shudder to Thinky, but also it's like the missing link between Def Leppard and Shudder to Think. Nathan, the guitar player for Shudder to Think in the second six years, and I were huge Def Leppard fans when we were in high school. So not punk. So you get a lot of that in Slow Down. There was a lot of the cars going on in Duran Duran a little bit. So Baby, on the one hand was me being super into, which I was toward the end of Shutter to Think, although nobody else would hear of it, electronic music. Warp Records was happening at the end of the 90s, and it was like this combination of synths, hardcore, and prog. It was like everything that I loved. And it was the most exciting thing happening, but there were no guitars in it, and so I was kind of driving everybody crazy in the band when I would play, like, Square Pusher, Apex Twin, or something in the van. So that, combined with having grown up and been a teenager in the 80s, and this concept I have, you have to remember that at the turn of the century, the endless 80s revival hadn't started yet. That wouldn't really kick in until, like, 2006 or 2007 or whatever. And so I had this idea for a band after Shudder to Think. I had this idea for a character after Shudder to Think. Let's call it almost like a Ziggy Stardust kind of character. Who, in my mind, I was like, what if happened if, let's call it the progressive, almost pretentious pop art tendencies of the first half of pop music in the 80s hadn't been shanghaied by hair metal, which basically ended the new wave. And if it had just continued... I mean, in terms of, like, white music, in terms of hip-hop and R&B, the golden age was just getting started. But in terms of, like, if you think about the progress, if you think about generally white pop radio, like, starting from the Beatles up through, like, Soft Cell or Duran Duran or Culture Club or whatever, that there was a premium on change and new ideas, even if some of them sucked. Right. Um, I think a lot of it, as always, had to do with technology and MTV and the rest of it. And then it sort of went very, very retrograde for a while with Guns N' Roses. I love Guns N' Roses, by the way, and I enjoy hair metal. But I remember the first time I heard Guns N' Roses, Nathan and I were, to get, were together and we were like, this is awesome. And it's like Aerosmith and Motley Crue and, you know, something a little punker. What we didn't realize was how boring and male and conservative things would get for a while there, including the alternative. Well, at the time, I just counted it as 70s, you know, regurgitated. Exactly. And that was really a bummer because, you know, through the mid 80s, you could actually hear new ideas on the radio. And then that sort of stopped. So Baby was my exercise in doing everything I wanted to do from like the Bay City Rollers to the Cars to, I don't know, Nine Inch Nails, you name it, all in one character or band to create this like my idea of a perfect New York nightlife band. But the New York that seduced me and lured me as a kid, Roxy Music, even though they weren't from New York, Blondie, whatever it was that I loved that was sort of dark and fun and bubblegum and still art, I was throwing into the, into the baby hopper, into the baby hamper, into the pram. And then on the other hand, some of the more traditional songwritery stuff that you started here on 50,000 BC went into my first solo record, Lapland. And that's like 70s AM gold influence there. So there were these sort of two sides that were happening at the time. And what you get with Slow Down is I, I think maybe the best or the most lasting, like I, I was listening to it this morning to write down those lyrics for you. And I was like, oh yeah, this song still totally holds up for me. It's really, really cool. And, and the, the sounds on it still have fangs and the melodies in it are still like sensual but bubblegummy and the lyrics in it are simple enough 
and again, bubblegummy enough, but still have this darkness to it or this late nightness to it. And I was, you know, I was in my early thirties. And so I was starting to have to think about growing up. And so there's this kind of bittersweetness to the whole enterprise where I'm kind of writing backwards and forwards and dreaming of a music scene that didn't exist. I was like, this is what I wish music were like. This is what I wish pop music were like right now.
we don't have to go too far into the arrangement here. I guess, so you wrote this, what I was saying in terms of the comparison to Shudder to Think is this geometrical songwriting. You're taking these pieces, you're, they're locking together, but because you're working with Pro Tools, because it's fundamentally a studio project, it has sort of a top-down architecture that Shudder to Think doesn't. Shudder to Think, you're with Sing it from the three ground guys, up. yes, that there are yeah. three of you together and like, okay, well, you've done the A section, what's next? Whereas mm-hmm. in this, it's, okay, I've got, well, it's, not necessarily a loop, but at least you had the dramas programmed for the whole thing. And you can start thinking about what am I going to dangle on. In particular, really the whole second half of the song is you get going on the refrain and it just repeats about five times and even has a whole one minute long fade out just with more and more stuff going on top of it of like, can I just do some vocal uh, florid squawking, you know, over this part to make this little bit jump out? You yeah, know, it becomes really quite chaotic by the end. In that sense, it's kind of like X French T-shirt. The end of X French T-shirt is the payoff. It just repeats, 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 repeats on basically one chord. And with slow down, it just repeats, 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 repeats one word for probably like half the song. And yeah, and I'm just like stacking and building. It is. It's very much a Pro Tools baby. So how did other people work on this? Like, did you get somebody else to come and lay the bass part down once you'd written it? If I played you the demo, you could hear what changed. Nothing changed. I basically, for most of the baby songs, I did everything myself. And then we went into the studio, replaced some drums, or in some cases overlaid drums onto program stuff. Mm -hmm maybe replaced some guitars, changed a couple little things and spiced up the mix. It was a pretty solitary studio project. Not live. Live, it was great. It was just like a kind of a sexy freight train. But the studio stuff has a an almost hermetic feel to it. You know, I meant to ask for Pebbles and stuff of that era. Did you use a click track or was it all just band chemistry? I think it was recording. all just band chemistry. Okay. We used, I think the first time we used a click track was on Pony Express record. Okay. I was trying to figure out, like, does it speed up from the beginning? It seems like maybe the intro is a little slower, uh, but it's pretty damn consistent. I mean, the drummer was solid. Mike is a metronome. He's got amazing, amazing time. So by the time you get to here, you say you, when you transition this to the live set, I mean, is there a bootleg of the live stuff <laughs> laying around somewhere that you'll release at some point? So we were just play with backing tracks because there's so much programming in it. And it was really before technology was such that people were able to be elastic with programming yet. So it was like a laptop with whatever little blips and squiggles we needed. And then we were a four piece with two female vocalists. And I don't know, was there even a synth? I don't even know if we had like a synth live. We were just kind of like, fuck it. Let's just do guitar, bass, drums, vocals, and put the rest of it on a laptop. So, you know, that's always a mixed bag. I think once we found our pocket live, we fully were able to transcend the limitations of being locked into a backing track. But there's also always something that's a bummer about that. It's just not jazz. And so it doesn't it doesn't have a cellular breathing quality to it. My first band when I was playing in the 80s in, in high school was because the Cars were my favorite band and oh, Heartbeat yeah. City, which is all sequenced to hell. And so, so I wrote stuff with a friend of mine on a sequencer, on a Casio CZ5000. Actually, I have a version of it that I now just use as a MIDI controller. And so you know, playing like the school variety show, we tried to do that live to have like get a drummer to listen to headphones so that I could have the drum machine click track so I could play my damn backing track. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned that. That album, that album, like many Mutt Lang albums of that era, has aged well, but it was really a bummer at the time because I think that, what's his name, Robinson, the drummer from, from the, the Modern yeah, Lovers. Lovers. What's his oh, name? Yeah. David Robinson, yep. David Robinson is one of, one of the greatest rock and pop drummers and Rick Ocasek was just using him less and less as the albums went on and they they lost so much joy i thought yeah it's been interesting to see some live stuff of them from that era or after that where they still managed to to pull off i think kind of what i'm picturing what you're talking about with baby of uh, you know have the guitarist kind of stretch out a little more you know the keyboardist is not doing anything different anything strange anything soloy uh right. but still there's room to emote and certainly if with a singer like you as opposed to those those guys who are their whole 
ethic was, you know, no rock star backflips. We are more dignified than all that. Yeah, that was never a problem for me. I never had that issue. <laughs> yeah, I guess anything else about the arrangement of this before we want to go on from here? You've got so many little goodies in here. This like the flange club keyboard. There are so many little treats in that song. It's real. It's a good headphone song. But it's interesting that, yeah, the... Is that the flange thing that you're talking uh, about? I was more thinking just over the... I mean, I know what, what you're talking about there, but the, over the room around us disappears, there's a kind of a... It's a more disparate little thing. Yeah, I was just sitting there by myself in my apartment with nothing to do and just attending to every detail in that Shutter to Think way, but alone using Pro Tools. Not aesthetically in the Shutter to Think way, but what we were talking about, about just going so deep into every little detail so that every track is its own treat. But one little aspect of that song that I just remembered, there's some Dre influence. So there's some of those keyboards in there. And yeah, that one keyboard, that ding, 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 which is the entire end of the song, is like a combination of something from Heartbeat City mixed with one of Dre's little keyboard lines, which I was pretty psyched about at the time. Well, and you've got the car's drum machine clap, clap under that big harmonized guitar riff that ends every verse that, well and that you do it it's harmonized with itself but then the high one extends the note longer yeah. interested to, to hear what we were thinking in terms of they're not exactly the same notes going through and it's not the same pattern that's the disorientation thing we were talking about that i like and there's something about slow down it's a little bit dark it's a little bit late night maybe too much happened that night and it's about it's a question is it time? Am I entering an era of diminishing returns? Is it time to slow down? And there's some nightlife disorientation in both musically and lyrically happening in my life in the year or two before that, when Shutter to Think had broken up and my old girlfriend and I had broken up and I was in a little bit of free fall trying to figure out what was next. So there is still this slippy disorientation and you hear that in that like dual guitar riff Mm -hmm. Even though it's kind of, again, Shudder to Thinky and Def Leppardy. And lyrically, so it sounds like, I mean, with this whole project, but this song in particular, it's sort of like you're playing disco. So, like, it's a little frustrating to me. I've got a 13-year-old daughter, and you know, she'll listen to pop music stuff in the car, and almost all the lyrics are about being out in the club. I mean, yeah. like... This has nothing to do with your life. Why is this appealing to you? I think it's just that's what's out there. And so you've got that here, but it's the way you're putting it, which wasn't totally clear to me just looking at the lyrics or reading it, was uh, that it's, I'm outliving this party lifestyle, and man, I should actually slow down. And the sick, sweet music of love, it's interesting. So when you wrote it, that it's, it's sick dash sweet. It's the sickeningly sweet. It's candy pop, that there's something gross about it. Whereas I was seeing it as more of a dark, the sick comma sweet, in other words, it's the sensual delights that corrupt you, something like that. I mean, I, I guess they're both in there. It's all of that. That's definitely what Slow Down is about. It's a song that exists in the present tense on the dance floor at the peak of a night and also the morning after reflecting or meditating on larger questions of, is this working anymore? You make these little tiny changes that I could not make out well, actually, first, since I tried to transcribe it myself before you sent me the lyrics, the six sweet music of love, ooh, drink it head to toe. That, since you go up to the falsetto, I had no idea what you're saying. I thought it was transit Ayatollah. I have a note here. Uh, it's transit Ayatollah. That is, I wish it had been. <laughs> so that first chorus, hot off you, tangled in the stars above. Okay, I understand the, the images there. But then the, when that returns later, it's hot off you, tender in the jaws of a baby. Yeah, that's my favorite image from the song. <laughs> Is the baby there and the prevalence of baby in the song and the name baby you were saying is a character of the band? Like what? Say more about that, that as a character. Naming the band baby allowed me to use the word baby, which is already the most used word in pop music as much as I wanted justifiably. And so it always had this like extra, it's at times wink, wink. And at times, really effective kind of weight to it. So tender in the jaws of a baby. I don't know. For me, that just works. It does both. It's like sensual and sweet. And it, 
you know, babies are the tenderest little innocent, inexperienced creatures, but they're fucking animals. I especially know that now. I did not know that at the time (laughs) from experience, but now I do. And so there's something just a little, there's a slightly creepy, I wouldn't go so far as to say, but there's a, it has a dark underbelly, which is something that always appealed to me that you get the, you know, again, talking about the spoonful of sugar around something a little bit unsettling. Well, I definitely get the embracing the word baby. You know, that was a symbol to me in my own songwriting of just even listening as a young teen as something that's inauthentic. Nobody talks like that. At least nobody I knew at a young age, you know, when you actually have a mature relationship, maybe you do pull out the baby when talking to your, right. your beloved, but it means you're entering a mode where you really you're making reference to older music. You're making reference to soul music and other stuff that is, is not really where you're coming from. It's not a Cleveland. It's definitely not a Cleveland one. No, it was more like, I actually think that I, I just remembered there's like one of a billion screes in my journal about this, that, or the other concept surrounding project or a band or a song or, you know, some kind of creative idea. And I remember writing some tract about taking back the word baby, reclaiming baby. And this was, you know, around the time that I was writing all this music. And so I definitely was having fun with that and meant it in fun. But that was part of it. It was like, wait, 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 there's a reason everybody uses the word baby in pop music. And and part of the band baby and sort of the character that I had in my mind was let's reclaim every trope. Let's do every cliche and like get to the bottom of why it became a cliche in the first place. And the reason things become cliches. It's archetypal. (laughs) Yeah, it's archetypal. And it so perfectly defines the thing that it is that it becomes a cliche and then everybody forgets the very thing that it was defining. So part of Baby and Lapland and even some of the stuff off of 50,000 BC, the more traditional tropes that I was exploring and playing with at the time, it was very important to me to get to the bottom of why they were great so that people could listen to them with fresh ears and really enjoy them without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which is, you know, maybe what we'd been doing in Shutter to Think. So let's make the transition to the third song, the last one we're going to talk in any depth about, which also, I mean, is built on tropes, was built to capture the trope of a campground song. (laughs) And also, there are so many songs on the radio now, and these same ones that my daughter plays to me, that have the whistling in them, kind of, and this deep this boom, like the giant chorus that comes out. And you really capture this in a song that there are multiple versions I was watching uh, that people have covered this on YouTube, just you know, playing it acoustically. So this is, you've stumbled onto something catchy enough that people are doing that, as opposed to Pebbles, that nobody's even written the chords down on the entire internet. Oh, I know, <laughs> That's I know. That, that hard to figure out. Although Pebbles was the song that Eddie Vedder was obsessed with so that he wound up inviting Shudder to think on tour with Pearl Jam, which was a wonderful thing. So I'll take that. Well, yeah, that's kind of why I felt the need to put an ex-French t-shirt at the beginning, just because Pebbles is almost too pretty compared to most of the, <laughs> like the Sonic Youth stuff, like Daydream Nation floats along like a wave, yeah. whereas so much of the other stuff is a little more gritty and maybe yeah. hard to get a handle of. And I guess the key with that geometric songwriting thing, as you were describing it, both with the lyrics that were little snapshots of things that you're saying, these are how they're connected together. But those three stories that you told about the three lines, there's no obvious connection. And that's kind of how the structural pieces of the music often sound with Shudder to Think is like this individual part, like this doesn't sound too weird, but now we're switching to this other thing. And like, well, what it's only repetition and the fact that there's a constant drum sound and that the characters of everybody in the band are so distinct in terms of your voice that it makes it sound like a whole song. And I just feel like it compels me to want to listen to it seven times until like, I know when the next thing is going to be. Oh, that's great. That's great. I love that. Uh, It's interesting to drop a little nugget. I had like a flurry of writing Shudder to think songs a few months ago just kind of I don't know why I just started writing 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 and you know I work most days on music for tv shows and music for movies and you know working on my own records and other people's records 
but somehow I was just writing all of this Shutter to Think material, and we'd been talking about maybe working on some new stuff, but everybody's scattered to the four winds and everybody's lives are very busy. For the past month or so, I've rehearsed a few times with Adam Wade, who is the drummer on Pony Express record, mm-hmm. and just another guy who's a friend of mine who is a fan of Shutter to Think and knows Stu's bass playing style. Stu lives in North Carolina, so he's nowhere nearby to practice. But um, we've just been working out some of these new ideas that I have. And it's interesting what you're saying about smushing together parts that maybe don't belong or that are unexpected, because they never ever occur to me as things that don't go together. They make perfect sense that this comes after this. And obviously we should go back to that. No, this is going to be so cool, but it's intuitive or instinctual and by no means correct because it's music. So it's whatever one one person's sense is another person's chaos. So, you know, it's been interesting 20 years later working on some new music and there were one or two points where Adam turned to me and he was like, that part, we can't put that chorus after that thing. And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? I'm like, of course we can. This is exactly how it goes. So it'll be interesting to see how this works out. And hopefully none of us know too much at this point. I think there's always a risk when people not go back to what they did when they were young and dumb. But if the music makes too much formal literal, sensible sense, that's not going to work. It's got to exist in that place. It needs to make sense in that place before something makes a traditional kind of ordered sense or, you know, that place right between when you're asleep and you're awake. Like, where a dream still makes sense and you're half-conscious of having dreamt it, that's where Shudder to Think music needs to exist. You know, like, when you're waking up in the morning, you're like, I just had the weirdest dream. I had like Kim Kardashian's butt on my elbow and was ordering yogurt from like my uncle. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like totally. Yeah. And then you wake up, you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. That image naturally flowed from the narrative that was going on in the previous you know, hour of sleep or however long it actually was. Yeah. So that's why I like all of that music to exist. And it's certainly where when I'm writing it, that's where it comes from. I meditate a couple times a day and I do transcendental meditation. And when I am quote unquote transcending, which usually happens if I'm lucky briefly a couple times in 20 minutes, um, there's a real kind of clarity, but it's non linear. It's like pre linear, a primordial kind of a clarity And that's sort of what I like Shudder to think music to feel like and where I like for it to come from. So it'll be interesting to see how this new stuff evolves. Well, so this digression back to Shudder to think was all just to point out the contrast to this song we're about to hear. I am a wolf. You are the moon. So tell us about to what extent was this sort of written on assignment that you had to do a particular song that would meet certain requirements. Tell something about that. Was this a natural just songwriting outgrowth that you said, hey, use the... My gut says play the song first okay. and, then, and then I'll tell you the story about All right. it. We want it all. Our time is coming soon. We walk it all. Thunder in my head, flowers in my bed, I saw you.
So the context I've seen on the Wet Hot American Summer first day of camp, this Netflix series, another David Wayne thing. You've done a million things with David Wayne. It seems like that's been your primary hook into the entertainment industry is sort of those networking things that you built around that. Is that correct? It's interesting. David and I have been best friends since we were like two years old. We grew up together in Cleveland and it was his basement, which was really our formative production studio. He would make videotapes of himself on like a beta cam dressed up in ridiculous costumes, just doing weird David Wayne monologues, which are really not different from what you hear and see in White Hot American Summer. And we would record songs. We had a band set up and a two-track reel-to-reel tape recorder. So it was really our formative years were spent in his basement doing exactly what we do now. We went to college at NYU together and first day of college met and became best friends with Ken Marino, who is a member of the state and blah, blah, blah. So that became my whole crew and they needed music. And I was their music friend because I was in this band Shudder to Think. We had actual records and I had a four track. So I would do music for their black box theater shows. And then once the state started happening, Teddy Shapiro and I did music for it. And then we both did music for Wet Hot. And the relationship continues with all of them, actually. So I guess, yeah, certainly my most consistent and longest working relationships have been with David and with all of my friends from the state. And where does Isaac Carpenter fit into this? I see he's co-credited with you as performing this. So I have a composing team called Pink Ape, which has evolved over the past maybe four or five years because I was doing everything myself and needed to be able to take on more work, multiple projects, expand things a little bit so that I could actually be a present father, husband, and have time to still do my own projects, like make records and write Shutter to Think songs. So, you know, like with Baby, there's so many amazing artists and musicians that I know. And at this point, really in our 30s and my 40s, but some people's 30s, everybody seems to gravitate at some point or other toward film and TV. It's virtually the only place to both be wildly creative and make a good living. And so I'm basically trying to create this environment where a lot of my composer, songwriter, and musician friends can all create music together for film and TV in a way that's like half band, half collective, half scoring sound house. And Isaac Carpenter is in a band, Louder Milk. In Gosling, I see. In yes. Gosling. And they were younger than us, but huge Shudder to Think fans who are A&R guy from Epic Records signed after us. And um, we subsequently got to be friends and we all play music together. Mark from Louder Milk and Gosling is also part of sort of extended family of pink ape artists. And so Isaac has worked as a part of my scoring team on various TV shows and movies. So there's always five different projects and 10 different songs. And sometimes there are these eras, particularly with Wet Hot American Summer last year, where songs get written very, very fast. Like I'll get a call in the morning and they're like, we need a Mumford and Sunset, you know, or like we need Kesha thing, like whatever it is. And we need it by two. Okay, sure. And it's actually a wonderful way to work in contrast to what we've been talking about the whole time, like something like Pebbles or Slow Down or the music that I work on for me, which is much more of a slow cooker. But I like to do all of it because I think that writing fast, writing slow, writing for tuba, writing for voice, it all feeds the other. And you're hooked up enough to the mainstream of music that's coming out that when somebody says, we need a Kesha-like thing, you don't have to then spend two hours listening to Kesha because I would need some work. On I'm like a pretty voracious music listener. I'm, I'm a pop whore. I'm, I'm a radio guy. And I'm also like an underground weirdo. I just love music. I just want to hear it all. I want to devour it. And I haven't, that has never gone away, which I'm very grateful for. There are definitely times where I've had to be like, well, what's the difference between a Katy Perry song and a Kesha song? And so 
I'll have to go online and be like, oh, well, on this, they tend to go A, B, A, B, chorus, or A, B, A, B, you know, bridge, whatever. And, or like on this kind of on this kind of pop song, they tend to drop out for the chorus. On this type of pop song, they tend to like anthem out on the chorus. It has more to do with like contemporary production styles. Sure. Like and taking apart that watch. And for me, because I'm self-taught, the way that I learn music and production is by taking apart the watch. And so I love getting to go into somebody's track. Like with Mumford and Sons, you know, I was like, I don't know. I, I get what they are, but like, why would I spend more than three seconds listening to these guys? Like I've heard it. So I had to like go in there and actually listen to what all of the little ticks and signatures were of their music. I was like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. Stomps and claps and whistles and the. So I did that, and Isaac was over, and I wrote most of I Am the Wolf, You Are the Moon really fast. But as is often the case, because I come from the band Shudder to Think, I'll write too many parts. And Mm -hmm. at this point, I'm able to play and sing at the same time, so I don't have to write the music, figure it out, record it, and sing. So I'll just be walking around my studio with a guitar or in my backyard trying to figure out this chord progression. And again... It goes back to what we were talking about with Slow Down and 50,000 BC and Lapland to a certain extent, that I love the assignment of having to do something that people think of as cliche or as a trope, because it's a challenge to beat the trope and to beat the reference, right? So in this case, I had to get over my own sort of poo-pooing that whole whatever thing that was going on a couple of years ago and be like, okay, go into it. Like figure out why people love this. How do these songs work? What are the chord progressions? Like, what are the melodies? Like, what are the little production ticks on it? So I wrote the song really quickly. Isaac was here and Isaac's so good. He's like a meat and potatoes guy. He's so good at editing stuff and getting to like the nub of the thing. He's kind of a genius. And he was like, cut out this part. And by the way, you need like, when you go here, it needs like a, whoa, whoa. Like, oh, yeah, it sure does. He was like, something, I don't know, like something like that. And he just like shouted it out. And we're like, great, let's record it. Oh, well, that's good to hear because I could not picture how that whoa, whoa, whoa could have come out of your brain. And so that it didn't. <laughs> and so he helped me trim it. And then we recorded it really fast with stomps and claps and whistles and sent it in. They loved it. Everybody fell so in love with it. And one editor said, oh, this is cool. This reminds me of, it's like that Mumford and Sons track, right? Because the assignment was to give them a Mumford and Sons track. So we totally produced it up. And then like legal and a musicologist who was the most fascinating character I'd ever met all got called in. And then it was like, two weeks of picking apart this song and writing new versions of this song because it couldn't go the melody in the Mumford and Sons song. song. And by the way, the basic chords and melody of I Am a Wolf have nothing to do with the Mumford and Sons song. Wet Hot, they needed to write like 35 original songs for this eight episode series. And, um, There was a really important scene where Andy, Paul Rudd's character, is singing a song, a a really emotional scene, where he's singing a song with all of the other counselors, and it becomes a montage that, it's a joke of a montage, but I feel like this relates to what we've been talking about in terms of transcending tropes and like reclaiming kind of the essence of things that moved us about music in the first place that one of the brilliant things that David Wayne does and that the state does and that everybody from that group's work does is they're able to tell a joke and make you cry at the same time not cry with laughter but actually like in this scene with Andy like it needed to make the viewer feel have that feeling like they were 16 at summer camp for the first time again, while also being the sort of meta commentary on like the types of people at camp. So I was like, wait a minute, I think I'm a wolf would be great for this. So I wonder what style we could do it in that would feel authentic to like 1980 or 1981. And 
you know, ultimately, I'm not sure if I quite hit that. So basically, within the TV show, we just had Paul Rudd playing it. It was interesting. I was on set practicing it with Paul and teaching it to him. And he's like, Paul's an amazing singer and musician. So he just, he gets things instantly. And I was teaching it to all the counselors, you know, which are really, again, like, this ensemble where we've been working together for since our twenties and everybody on the set was just like, couldn't get this song out of their head. And it just became like, this just an earworm. It's just one of the songs. And I was like, Oh, okay. I guess this is just like one of those songs. And I don't know why, but I'm definitely not going to fight it. And then I think we found a way within the show for Paul to play it in a way that felt authentic to the time just on acoustic guitar. And then for the end credits of the episode, when we had songs that campers or counselors were singing within the series, we would do the sort of original recordings uh-huh. of them at the end, you know? So like, oh, okay, this is a song that all of the counselors and campers in 1981 know. So what song is it? Like, who did it? And then Jarek Bischoff, who's also part of my team, was like, well, what if it's sort of like a Simon and Garfunkel production thing? And then for the end credits version, we made it, you know, a little bit. It's got a little Simon and Garfunkel. It's got a little Lee Hazelwood. It's got a little, I don't know what else it's got in it. But, you know, we just tried to make it feel authentic to maybe late 60s, early 70s. Okay, even though it could be mistaken for a Mumford & Sons <laughs> track in terms of this final version still has a lot of those Yes, it became one of those like hybrids where it's like, all right, this is a new thing that could be an old thing. I don't know if we sure. you know, 100% nailed the authenticity on it, but it didn't matter because everybody loved the song. Sort of the depth of the arrangement, sort of how huge and symphonic it sounds. Like that's kind of the difference that a, a modern Mumford & Sons thing, you've got in here that, da, 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 which then by the last chorus, you're repeating that more often instead of just putting it at the beginning, that that's the thing along with you know a lot of voices that it makes it sound like a giant cavernous thing. But then when yeah. you have hand claps and stuff that are almost at the level of that, then it seems to make it more Simon and Garfunkel earthy, like you were saying. Yeah, right, right. So it's interesting sonic mix. Well, damn, I'm sure we could spend another two hours talking about your your (laughs) soundtrack (laughs) experiment, but we should just introduce the last song. I wanted to have something from one of your recent solo albums. I know I've gotten to hear the in-progress tracks from your, we think, will be released in late 2016, Adult Desire, is that right? But this one is from Wand. 2011 called Heaven Sent. I know this is when we were talking about perhaps making this one to actually discuss, but even though we chose something else for that, I wanted to keep this in here because it's just so wonderful and pure and like capturing a moment of slow motion play of light or something. I'll just give you a couple little tidbits about Heaven Sent. I started writing Heaven Sent in Shudder to Think and never finished it. I started writing it at a time where I was in a very deep Frank Sinatra. Uh, I was bewitched. <laughs> and um, so for whatever reason, I was thinking about those sort of classic lyrics and somehow classic melodies. And even though it didn't come out sounding anything like that. You'd have to slow it down by about half just to, to get to that Frank Sinatra 1930s or, you know, the early movie ballads. Yeah, exactly. So that, that was where it started. But I mean, at the same time, X French t-shirts started off, I was thinking about Joni Mitchell. So go figure. So with Heaven Sent, I was thinking about Frank Sinatra and I tried it so many times and I just never got the right recording of it until finally I did. And my friend Sam Mickens added some beautiful nylon string guitar on it. And Jarek Bischoff, who, you know, both of whom I work with and they play in a wonderful band called the Dead Science, did the string arrangements. And then it just came to life. And I was like, oh yeah, this is worthy of my wife who is dedicated to. Well, thank you so much. This was super awesome. Good. I'm glad. Have a great day. Thanks so much, Mark. You must be heaven sent That chocolate box of boyfriend sent you where sent me Kiss me 
Well, that was pretty great. This was a long one, and he had a lot to say. In fact, I even cut out some digressions about how wonderful My Bloody Valentine is and some other things like that. Again, please go to nakedlyexaminedmusic.com to hear more episodes or craigwedron.com to hear more of his music. Very excited about the next interview. It's with Narada Michael Walden. You may not recognize the name, but you definitely recognize some of the work he has produced. I've also recorded interviews with some more ladies. Carrie Acri from... Hammerbox, as well as Jill Sobule, who is a songwriter that really deserves your attention, if anyone does. And since we talked about it, the music that is fading in right now is Craig Wedren's intro theme to the 1990s sketch comedy show, The State. Keep an open ear and open mind. Keep your spirits up. Keep on musicking. This is Mark Lintonmeyer signing off. <laughs>